All right. Hey, Alex, how's it going? Hey, Sam, how are you? Good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm having some, uh, some audio stuff. Let's do this. Audio difficulties aren't good. Aren't good. We just got to go. Just go through it. Just bust through every wall. Seems like a recurring recurring theme for for our okay coin okay lives. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I had it before. You have it now. But welcome everyone. We're here. We're live. We're figuring it out. It's a beautiful Friday, and I'm Friday. excited for today. Oh yeah, why's that? Well, you made fun of me. You and the rest of all a little alpha leak. You know, Sam and uh, and some of the OK uh, coin people made fun of me before. They were like, "What's on your wall? What's on your wall? It's so it's so corporate." <laughs> That's you know what that is. That's my accounting degree. Do you know what I started my career as, Sam? Uh, as a, a CPA. As a CPA. No way. As a CPA. Well, Here like we it. go. Taxes and Bitcoin and oh, crypto. Yeah. Woo! Favorite thing. Favorite thing. You know, by the way, I think that today is going to be the most valuable and underrated discussion we've ever had. Because... Everyone needs to pay taxes, and it's hard as heck to pay taxes in crypto. I actually am going to say that it's uh, it's because of the tax system that we're at the top of the market. Bull run is over. <laughs> Everybody's just got to sell to uh, to make up for all these huge profits that they've had this year. Everybody's rich, and now they owe the government. <laughs> That's right. Uncle Sam is going to... Uh, is going to get his money's worth as well. So see, yeah. see what happened there? See what happened there? <laughs> so should we welcome our guests and get going? Because I'm excited. I got tons of questions. I need to know what to do with my taxes. I'm prepping for 2022. Many new laws are coming in. I think this is going to be pretty good. So uh, you guys out there, start taking notes. Get your pens and papers out. And uh, this is going to be a good one. All right. Uh, so uh, today... We have uh, we have tax bit here. Uh, we have uh, Aaron Jacob, and we have Aaron Finnamore, who are here to answer all of our questions about uh, how much we owe this year, which is a lot. Awesome! So, Hi everybody. Hi quick, everyone. Quick room shuffle on my side. So, yeah. but great to be here with you. <laughs> so, I how does one get in? How does one become like a, a crypto accountant, other than like losing all your friends because they think that you're you're crazy at working <laughs> with. Uh, just esoteric stuff. <laughs> um, I'll tell you from my side, uh, you know, tax bit and crypto found me. Um, so I was, you know, at a larger accounting firm uh, dealing with this kind of small niche area of information reporting, and it's not necessarily a right, widespread specialty. And so they found me. And, you know, since then, it's been a really exciting dive into the whole digital asset world and relating that back to like traditional tax reporting. And so that's, that's my story. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. So I'm the other Aaron. Uh, we'll make it easy on on you, Sam and Alex here. Just say, Aaron, you're gonna you're gonna get an answer. Um, similar story on my side, honestly. I spent ten years in traditional financial markets. I was working in uh, the derivative space, helping companies with financial risk management, doing subledger accounting technology. Uh, prior to that, I worked at the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And um, the, the industry is very much in its infancy, but going so quickly. There's, there's so much growth. Uh, there's so much innovation. It's a really exciting thing to be a part of. And so having the infrastructure in place to support that innovation and growth and rapid adoption is really critical for the future uh, of the industry and being able to continue to see that asset class go mainstream. Were your like normie CPA friends like... Do they understand why you're going into crypto? Because I've I've met some CPAs before, and they seem pretty, um, you know, they're pretty by the book. They they have their uh, passive investment schemes, and uh, you know, they're very they're very on it. So going into a a high risk, high volatility asset class must have been a bit of a jump. Yeah, uh, CPAs they definitely tend to be a little bit more um, risk averse. So yeah, there there were there are a couple of sideway glances, but. You know, as folks uh, see and recognize the pace of the industry, again, the innovation, where things are going, seeing traditional finance lean into the space, 
Um, I think most folks, when they really dive in and they start to learn about it, they, they see how transformative it can be um, and how we're really seeing the future of finance being rewritten. So, uh, yeah, some sideways glances, but at the same time, it's a really exciting thing to be a part of. Yeah, so, uh, so fun fact for me, I am not a CPA. I am an attorney. So even less risk adverse <laughs> um, on my side, but honestly, doing taxes is not the most exciting thing. So all of my colleagues were like, crypto and taxes, at least you're doing something exciting with taxes. So um, I had a little, I had that reaction. <laughs> I remember when I, when I was first coming in and I had, you know, a bunch of uh, CPA friends and I remember they would say, yeah, I pay my taxes always in the last day so I can maximize the investment income. And I was like, oh, wow, that's a great idea. You know, you pay taxes on the 15th and April 15th and you maximize it. But what are you invested in this whole time? They don't want to prepay. They're like, yeah, well, bonds. And I'm thinking, man, they are they're missing the point completely here about what's, <laughs> you know, about this world that's out there um, uh, and, and taxes. But guys, maybe maybe I can open it this way because. I remember when I was getting in, the good ex-CPA that I was, uh, and I didn't tell you guys this, but this is my accounting degree over here. So this is a very special, nice. special OK Coin Live for me. Uh, but look, getting into the space, I guess let's break this down, space down to three types of people. The new people that are getting in now, OK, that are just getting used to crypto. Um, actually, two types. And the people that have gone in in 2017, 2013, 2014, because now there are a bunch of tools and I'm sure you guys will talk about your tools of just how to track all the trades. And, you know, do you even have to pay taxes on all the trades? So I moved from Bitcoin to Ethereum, from Ethereum to, uh, I don't know, um, uh, Miami coin, let's say, do I need to pay taxes on that? And then how do I track it all? Yeah. Great question, Alex. I'll take the first stab and then Aaron will fill in and, and, and uh, correct me. Um, you know, it's interesting. We talk about cryptocurrency. Uh, people talk about it all the time. It's really for tax purposes. It's not a currency. It's crypto property. That's how the IRS views it. Uh, that's how it fits into the code. That's how it's taxed. So what that means is you have to track the purchase price for every single one of your coin purchases. So if I go to buy Bitcoin, I need to be able to track that and I need to I need to keep track of the cost that I paid for it or the price that I paid for it. In tax terms, that's called your cost basis. And then the future tax that you pay on that, whether it's a, a, a liability or a benefit to you, the gain or the loss, it's dependent upon the difference between what you sell that asset at and what you paid for it. If you sell it at a higher price, you've seen appreciation in property and you therefore have a realized gain and you're taxed on that gain. If you were to sell it at a lower price, you have a depreciation of property and therefore you have a realized loss. So tracking all of your cost basis across all of your purchases is what's really important and, and, and makes it a little bit complicated. And then the other thing that you pointed out, Alex, was like, what is a taxable event? You know, I buy Bitcoin and I sell Bitcoin. OK, it makes sense that that sale could create a taxable uh, gain for me. But what if I trade Bitcoin for Ethereum or for any other uh, crypto for that matter? Those are also taxable events. And so being able to track um, all of your activity whether it's centralized exchange or it's in the DeFi space, being able to track all of that, given the volume and the trading activity can be very, very complicated. But that's the most important thing for people to just wrap their mind around. This is this is property from a tax perspective. And you've got to keep track of every single one of those transactions uh, in that asset class. So I want to ask you guys about how to track and then we should talk about how to track. And there's tons of places to go. But let me ask you this. If I got into crypto in 2013, 2017, and I had made a bunch of trades, what the heck is my cost basis? How do I go back now and figure out what that cost basis is? Let's say I bought Ethereum at $10. And now I just sold a little bit of Ethereum. I went from Ethereum to Bitcoin. 
how do I prove to the IRS before all of these tools were made? Or I bought Bitcoin, you know, way back at for three hundred dollars, and I traded. How do I prove to the IRS what my cost basis is? Yeah, I think that that's a tricky part, right? Um, just kind of taking a step back, which what makes this so much more difficult with crypto is the lack of requirements on these exchanges, right? Like in traditional investing, the banks required to provide you all of that information, you know, Morgan Stanley, you're trading Apple stock, you're buying, you're selling. The bank is basically handing you white glove a 1099B account statement, they're giving you everything you need for reporting. That's not yet required for crypto. And so that's why it's basically, someone asked me the exact question you asked, right? It's just, you know, it's honesty system, right? Honor system of of making sure that you're personally tracking the, the purchase price you're tracking, you know, the sale and, and you're reporting up towards your Schedule D on the 1040, right, for all of your potential gain and loss. Um, and so really the answer of how is is utilizing technology that is out there, like our tax fit consumer tools, to basically store all of this information that you would need to calculate your gains or losses. That's really the only way right now. I mean, certain exchanges, you know, they're definitely advancing in terms of the information they will provide you. But absent that, it's it's really on the you know investor level to make sure you're personally tracking all of this information. Then, Alex, from a solution perspective, you know, with our consumer product, for example, users can go in there. You can actually create a free account. Um, users can go in there and they're able to connect their trading uh, exchanges where they're you know transacting buying and selling and trading crypto they're able to connect all of that and then we go back through and find all your transactions we link up the entire history of that so that you know that purchase that you made in 2013 that's that's pretty difficult um we're able to find what the cost basis was for that so that you can accurately reflect the tax impact of that when you sell it, you know, eight years later. But how, how extensive is that coverage? I mean, we're in 2021 now. I think there's probably maybe a hundred different layer ones now. There's also lightning for Bitcoin and a bunch of other solutions like liquid and other things like what happens if you're not able to actually like get that information so readily? Because I, I know that like with all the <clears throat> development work that you guys have, there, there must be some blind spots that I may not be able to get to. Let's say there's a new uh, chain which just launched a week ago and I've got a couple of trades uh, on there. Like it, it seems that there could still be some difficulty in, in finding that uh, that information to import, at least as a CSV file into uh, TextBit. Definitely. Um, honestly, the one of the most important groups here at TaxBit is obviously our engineering team and, and troubleshooting all of those issues. Because just like you're saying, certain exchanges that we're, we're working with and we're linking into our consumer tool, they don't necessarily have all of the information available via public API. Mm -hmm. And that's what uniquely positions us because a lot of times we're you know, getting access to private APIs and troubleshooting directly with them. Because sometimes the exchanges, they don't even realize that gap exists. And so we're kind of helping them identify areas that... Um, they need to you know close the gap on so that ultimately their account holders can get access to this type of detail with that information yeah so like what happens um i the the thing that kind of worries me the most is like what, what happens when i move between chains let's say i go from like i take bitcoin out i have bitcoin i take it to mm -hmm. ethereum as like either wrap bitcoin or like uh, another type of bitcoin and then I move it to like Avalanche or I move it to Polkadot mm -hmm. or I move it to like any of the other ones. Is is every time that I go to a new chain, I get a new version of that wrapped Bitcoin on that chain. Is that a taxable event or is it just or is the or is the more important the thing, the fact that I have control over what is representative of that Bitcoin on in, in each instantiation? Yeah, it's a good it's an, a good and an important question, Sam. I think. Um, you know, the easiest thing for consumers would be able to say, 
um, it's taxable when I convert back into fiat currency, right? I buy Bitcoin and then I don't have a taxable event until I ultimately sell it and convert back into US dollar. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Instead, what happens if I buy Bitcoin and then I go to Ethereum and then I go to a different chain and a different chain, each one of those steps along the way is a taxable event. Um, in our conversations with the IRS and, and this, this, you know, the rules and regulations around this are uh, still being formed. Um, but the IRS has been pretty clear on this point that if you're if you're moving from one chain to another chain, that does constitute a taxable event. So you need to be able to track what was your cost basis on initial purchase? What was the disposition proceeds that were received, which then set the cost basis on the next position and so on and so forth. So there's this little bit of a of a chain link reaction where each of those steps, they constitute taxable events that you need to track and make sure that you have, um, you know, a good ground to stand on and justification for your position from a tax perspective. The other thing that I think is is really interesting that makes this challenging to your initial question is just think of a think of a, a, a simple example. If I go to Coinbase and I buy BTC, and then I transfer that BTC onto another exchange, let's say I transfer it to BlockFi. And then let's say I, I sell it, right? And I get back into fiat. What's interesting is the exchanges, um, today they're not sharing all the information that's associated with that. Well, we can talk about what the future will look like and some changes that are coming down the road. But, but today, BlockFi sees a transfer onto their platform. From my perspective, if I'm transferring BTC from Coinbase to BlockFi, a transfer does not constitute a taxable event. And so I actually want BlockFi to know what my cost basis was on Coinbase where I bought it so that I can accurately calculate my realized gain or loss when I subsequently sell it or trade out of it, et cetera. So that's part of what makes this challenging is when you're, when you're moving from asset to asset, that would be a taxable event, but when you're transferring on and off platform, that would not be a taxable event. So tracking all of that and putting that together within your own trading ecosystem as a consumer, um, it can be very challenging. And so using using a tool like TaxBits Consumer Tool, um, it does all that for you and it will be able to track cost bases across transfers and across platforms. So let me ask you guys a, a good follow on here. Um, and it might we might want to take, you know, 20 or 30 seconds for you guys to explain to our audience what these things are, because it's quite important. There are different cost bases, right? And let's say you bought one Bitcoin at 30 and you bought a second Bitcoin at 42, and you bought a third Bitcoin at 50, okay? So now you have 30, 42, and 50. Make it 30, 45, and 50 to make it easy. Then you sell a half of a Bitcoin later on, okay? Traditionally now, there, there are three main different ways of constituting tax bases, LIFO, FIFO, and then you choose the lots. So when you do this on Fidelity, when you choose stocks, you can say, hey, I sold this exact share. Here you're selling Bitcoin, so you don't technically, uh, it's kind of obfuscated which one of the three Bitcoin you sold. Or when you sell half a Bitcoin, does it come, you know, part from the third one, part from the second one, part from the first one? Can you talk a little bit about the LIFO method and what that is, the FIFO method and what that is of tax basis? And then when you, how can people choose lots and say, you know what, I'm actually selling the last one that I bought or the one I bought, you know, when the market went up to 65, I bought at 65, then it crashed to 30, I bought at 30, now I bought 52. So it's not the last one that I bought, it's the one I bought at 65. So I'm not capturing. When I'm selling, I'm not getting a taxable gain, right? I'm selling that old one where my basis is equal to the sales price, so I don't have any kind of gains. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because this, I think, is how people can optimize tax strategies. Yeah, so for sure. So so we see generally three different methods, right? HIFO, LIFO, and FIFO. So FIFO is first in, first out. LIFO is last in, first out. And HIFO is highest in, first out, right? Um, I, I cannot tell you how I would do this manually, um, but that's the honestly the biggest perk of our consumer tool because here's what how you um, kind of 
manage this accounting uh, or accounting method in our consumer tool. You have the option to set it. So a lot of exchanges are defaulting to um, what are they? They're FIFO. defaulting to LIFO, uh, FIFO. Right. Our our tax optimi optimizer defaults to HIFO because from a tax optimization perspective, highest in first out. Obviously, you're going to harvest your losses. Um, and so you're not inflating your gains. Um, and so that's really honestly like advice of how to manage this process, utilize a tool that you basically set your accounting method, and then it will specifically select those lots for sale or for usage based on that selection. But um, one thing to be careful of, people always ask, well, I want to do LIFO today. I want to do HIFO tomorrow. Like, Pick a method and stick with it for consistency throughout the tax year so you're not kind of <laughs> messing yeah, up the whole gain <laughs> loss information. And maybe I'm in trouble, just, Aaron. I'm in trouble. Maybe yeah. just this really practical for your viewers here, like going back to your example, Alex, where say you purchase at, I forget exactly what you said, but let's say you purchase at 30, then you had a purchase at 45, then you had a purchase at 60, and now the price is at 50 right? So if you are following a FIFO methodology, first in, first out, your 30 purchase would be the one being sold. And if you sell that 30 at 50, you have a 20 realized gain and you have a tax liability now because you realized a gain on that position. Whereas if you use like a HIFO methodology, which is also commonly referred to as a, as a spec ID, a specific identification methodology, which puts you in an optimal tax position where I could say, look, I don't want to sell the 30. I don't want to sell the 45. Those are both going to put me in gain positions. I am going to sell the 60, which actually puts me in a loss position. So I, I, I don't have a tax liability. I actually have a, a loss that I can write off against other capital gains uh, should I have those capital gains to, to write them off against. And so it puts you in a very different tax position and it allows you to optimize um, your trading activity throughout the year for uh, what, you know, what will be your best answer at, at the end of the day from a, from a cash and tax obligation perspective. Now, none of that is like trying to weasel your way around the tax code. All of that is absolutely allowable. Um, but the problem that people run into is it's awfully hard to track all that stuff. Like, how do you know what lot you should sell unless you have verifiable transactional based activity to back it up? And you do need to support it. And, and, and you know, should you be audited, you need to be able to, to back it up. So that's why using these tools becomes so critical. The volume of transactions can become very high. Tracking all of that is, is, is messy and it gets detailed. Um, but doing it is well worth the the time and effort. And now the effort is very low when you're leveraging tools. It's well worth it because you can greatly uh, improve your tax position. So I wanted to ask about another um, optimization strategy, which is the wash sale. So uh, from what I know, um, the wash sale allows you to like sell an asset. And as long as you don't uh, buy back for what, I think it's like 30 days uh, or something, uh, there's some tax optimization that can happen there. So like, What's actually happening with wash sales? And I, I heard that they were changing the rules at the end of the year for them. Yeah, so I can take that one. So, so wash sale currently does not apply to cryptocurrency. So that's the biggest benefit right now. If I, you know, I'm trading trading traditional equity, wash sale applies. You, you know, um, you can buy a highly correlated stock, but you can't buy the same exact stock. That does not apply in cryptocurrency. I can sell Bitcoin right now and buy it back two, two minutes later. Um, there are proposed regulations to basically apply those wash sale rules to cryptocurrency. They have not gone through yet, but it is definitely something that I think across the industry we are somewhat anticipating. But, um, you know, bringing it back to to the tax bit tools, what we do is we just we can basically kind of like circumvent the wash sale rules where we give you a highly correlated asset so that you can purchase that asset 
as soon as you dispose of the other asset. So let's like say, you know, you sell ETH, we will show you the correlated other cryptocurrencies that you can immediately buy back. Well, I mean, I, is this, sorry, yeah, so somebody, just quickly, is this now? Because now there are strategies of, let's say, uh, let, let's give our audience an example. You buy Bitcoin at 60, okay? Yep. And Bitcoin falls to 30. You can sell, you say you have one Bitcoin, you can sell that one Bitcoin at 30, claim a $30,000 loss, buy it right back a second later at 30. You've readjusted your basis to 30. So when it goes up and you sell it, you'll pay tax. But that's legal. So that's tax harvesting, right? So someone in the chat asked about tax harvesting. That's exactly. Yep. And that's legal. It's absolutely fine. Yep. And I believe there are software that does it for you automatically. Yep. What you're saying is in case wash sale rules come in where you can no longer do that, you give people a suggestion of a, mm -hmm. you know, like a Bitcoin. Let's say you sell Bitcoin and you buy GBTC or something yep. along those lines where it's a very similar asset. GBTC yep. is the grayscale Bitcoin trust, a similar asset or an ETF that gives you the same type of exposure in case those laws are coming in or even yeah. now you give people those suggestions. So we give we do not do it now uh, for crypto because the wash sale rule is not in effect. We do it for equities, though. Got it. OK, mm -hmm. Sam, sorry to cut you off. I know you oh, were, yeah. were going to ask something. So NFTs have been like super hot this year, like mm -hmm. so hot. Uh, but not all NFTs are the same. Uh, on the one hand, we have like Uniswap V3 positions, which are a uh, ERC721. But then we also have uh, you know, like a CryptoPunk, which also may be a ERC-721. So is there a difference in the two assets and how are they treated from a tax perspective? Were you going to say something, Aaron? I was going to say that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much going on in the NFT space right now. And, you know, I, I won't pretend to be an NFT expert. We have a whole team that's focused on that. We're building out our technology to support that. From a tax perspective, though, it's the same thing. You're purchasing an asset. It's a digital asset. You got to track mm -hmm. your cost basis. When you sell it subsequently, you got to be able to calculate what your realized gain or loss was. And you have a tax obligation on that. Now, it's not, you know, NFTs aren't, aren't fungible in quite the same way. And so, like a spec ID or a HIFO is is really what you're going to do for, from a tax perspective, because, you know, that might be your only NFT. Um, and I know there are some distinctions there, but uh, essentially the, the tax treatment's the same way. It's property that you own and you've got to be able to calculate the difference between what you paid for it and what you sold for, uh, what you sold it for. So I had seen some stuff on crypto Twitter about how uh, it, like art NFTs specifically are considered as collectibles. And so they have a different tax treatment that you're not able to apply uh, um, long-term capital gains to it, that it has like a fixed, um, just like I think it's like 24% short-term rate. Uh, and then um, you can subtract the fees. So if you, let's say you, pet, you, you uh, sell an NFT for a hundred ETH and it has a, a 10 ETH uh, fee that goes to OpenSea, um, you'd be able to subtract that from the, the purchase price uh, in the ETH that you're receiving. Even though it's sold for 100, you claim it as 90. Yes, there's special, that's why there's special categorizations on that form 8949 that you're ultimately classifying your gains and loss for, for collectibles. To identify it is a collectible. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that one kind of big open area that hasn't been solidified from a tax perspective is uh, the royalty aspect of NFTs. That's one area, at least from, from my perspective, that I think is still, um, for, for the tax world, we still need to understand more about NFTs. Um, because if you think about it, like in today's world, royalties come into scope a lot of times for these works of art or, you know, IP. And NFTs are different in that there they're can't necessarily be copies made. It's one unique uh, property. And so that's why the NFT world, at least from a tax perspective, is, is very, very new. Okay. So I, that's on the NFT side. What, what about like in Uniswap? So Uniswap, Uniswap V3 came out this year. Is there any tax difference between what happens with Uniswap V2 and V3? Because... With V2, you get a token back, but with V3, you're actually getting an NFT back. So is there a distinction tax-wise and uh, are they handled differently? 
I wouldn't necessarily say they are because um, you're getting something back, whether it's a token or you're getting an F NFT back. Currently, both of those are considered property. Um, and so, again, it's looking at the gain or loss. Okay. So I actually have a follow on to this. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about DeFi. Um, well, actually, I have three DeFi airdrops and mining, which are very unique uh, uh, cases in, in crypto. So when I'm in DeFi, okay, let's let's just make use a very easy example. I take stacks, I stack them on OKCoin, OK shameless plug, and I get Bitcoin back. I get my Bitcoin rewards back every two weeks. That Bitcoin reward, what is it? How is it taxable? And at what cost basis? Yeah, this is great. Um, and by the way, we might put, we might include some links or, or Alex, Sam, we can figure out how to share some of these links. We've got some good please, articles please. on our blog. We'll have our team share it with, with you guys. So you can share it with the audience um, to do some more detailed reading on this because there's, there's some really, there, there can be some nitty gritty stuff, but there's some great reading out there. Um, and then, you know, happy to, to happy to engage in some follow-up questions. But it, the short story is when you are, uh, deploying capital in the DeFi space and in any type of yield generation activity, it could be staking, um, it could be, you know, liquidity pool rewards, it could be lending, a variety of things. What you are receiving as yield from those activities, you need to be able to track that. And what what you typically do is you're going you're going to basically say, all right, what is the fair value when I receive those rewards mm -hmm. and the fair value of those rewards that I receive, that becomes the cost basis of my position in those assets. And then importantly, um, because that is setting my cost basis, it's also impacting my tax obligation uh, from an income perspective. So you didn't necessarily like if I'm staking, I'm receiving staking rewards. I've got staking rewards that's not a sale of my initial assets. So it's not a capital uh, gain or loss that, that I'm then taxed on. Instead, it's income generating activity. So I've got to track the income that I'm generating from my DeFi activity and um, report that as earnings, uh, as, as a consumer. And then it sets my cost basis in the asset. So that when I subsequently sell those, those rewards that I received, then I could have a capital uh, gain or loss as a result of that mm. subsequent transaction. So and I just I just want to make sure I understand. So let's say I put again I put stacks a stack stacks on OKCoin and in two weeks I get one whole Bitcoin back. I have a lot of stacks. <laughs> I get my Bitcoin back and it comes back at uh, sixty five. That's the co the cost of Bitcoin sixty five thousand. That's the basis, right? Mm. Then I hold on to that Bitcoin, okay? And the cost falls down to 60. I sell it. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, I would, I would technically have to record a gain of one Bitcoin at 65 because I got it at the point of the reward. That's my gain, 65,000, right? Then at the sale, it's a loss of 5,000. It goes against that gain and other gains. Did I, did I understand you guys correctly? So, so the reward is technically um, income. So mm -hmm. if you're getting a reward, it's the the income to you is the fair market value of that Bitcoin. But at the time of the reward, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So and then and then conversely, so that's not necessarily gain or loss. That's just income. income. That would go on mm -hmm. a separate section. So the income. However, when you get that Bitcoin. Um, it sets your cost basis, right? So then if you ultimately sell at a loss, then you take that loss, which would then go to a different part of your personal tax return. So Perfect. they're they're just treated differently. Perfect. And what's important a, from like yeah. a tax rate perspective is ordinary income might be taxed at a different rate than your capital gains and losses are. So that's an important distinction for, for people to make. You know, my, my capital gains and losses, I might be at a 15% rate, right? Uh, max a 20% rate. Um, whereas my ordinary income rate might be much higher. 
um, depending on you know what tax bracket you fall in, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's it's an important, a little bit of a nuance, but an important distinction to make. Um, and that's that's why we we allude to income versus and distinguishing between income and capital activity, capital gains and losses on subsequent sales. So just one, one more follow on, because I think it goes along the same lines. So let's say I'm mining now. Let's say I'm mining New York City coin. I mean, mm -hmm. Miami coin. And uh, from that mining, I get, um, well, I put in stacks and I get back New York City coin. Uh, and then is that the same does, do the same rules apply when I mine? Yeah, the, the mining um, is, I find that the mining is a little bit tricky the way the IRS has kind of classified income generated from mining. So the IRS, not a lot's been issued, right? There's not, there's a lot of gray area. There's very little black and white. This is an area where the IRS through the crypto FAQs did address it. And they see I, uh, mining as income to the, you know, ultimate individual, or it could be a business, but they classify it if you're operating as a business. So mining income through a trade or business is like, well, what is that? You know, I'm just doing it on the side for my personal benefit. Is that really a trade or business? Taking a super conservative view, I would say this mining in sh income should be classified similar to like reward income and that it's just general income. And what about, what about transaction fees? Like right now, if I want to do a, like a, a swap on Ethereum, it costs around $150. If I want to do some more complex transactions, it could be upwards of four or $500. Mm -hmm. So is, can I deduct that against my income somehow or capital gains? Um, yeah. hundred percent. You should track it so that you can, mm -hmm. you can, you know, use it to your advantage. So a, a real simple, simple example is if, if I, you know, buy BTC and I, I am charged a fee for that transaction, I can add that fee um, to the cost basis of my coin. So what it's therefore doing is it's reducing a subsequent realized gain by the amount of the fee. So it is important to be able to track those fees because, um, it should reduce your subsequent tax liabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 what about what about airdrops? We had a pretty major one with ENS this week, and um, like when do I actually claim? Like w w when do I um, claim the income from the airdrop? Is it when it's actually it, it hits my wallet, or is it when I? Uh, sell it or what is it? What, we we should share there? another blog article. Yeah. I think there was one that recently came out about, about airdrop specifically. But yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Sam. Basically, um, the fair value will set your cost basis, mm -hmm. which will also set the, you know, what you're obligated to pay taxes on. And then subsequently, when you sell, you'll compute a capital gain or loss based upon the change in value from when it was first received. So, and Aaron just posted this, so we'll get it posted up for everybody else. But yeah, that's the gist of it. So it's really important. The, ENS, the ENS thing was a big deal. We had some, some, some uh, people in our office here who were part of that and, you know, it's great. And they, they had some good things happen there, but don't forget the tax obligation part of that as well. But so could I, could, could I, so could I like make a coin uh, set it, set like the rate of the coin or like the price of the coin to like $1 trillion on Uniswap and then send Alex that coin. And then is he Don't liable? Send me that for... coin. Don't send me that <laughs> coin. Is he, is he liable for that, for that taxable income? Uh, or d w w what's going on there? Even though, even though there may be like zero, only a dollar of liquidity in yeah. the, the rate that's actually being paid for that coin that I sent him, you know, theoretically, I mean, I, does he actually owe a trillion dollars? We will stop being friends. We will stop being friends. <laughs> I, I think that goes to like, can you unilaterally select, uh, set a fair market value to a trillion dollars? There's definitely going to be some, some guidelines around that. Um, mm -hmm. That basically that uh, supposes that someone else would pay one trillion dollars for that, and if that's not the case, then that's not it's not valued at one trillion dollars. So somebody's going to call your bluff on that one. So yeah, yeah there's, there's, you don't have an ability to, 
you know, torpedo Alex's tax position and, and put him in a real tough spot. Just because, I mean, fair value is driven off of market third party transactions mm -hmm. rather than an, an arbitrary assignment of value, you know, that's not backed up by real third party uh, transactions. So, yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. But in the instance where you do receive assets that have actual um, value uh, uh, attributable to them, then you're obligated to recognize that as income. What if you I guys, don't want to? What if I don't want to receive? Oh, sorry, my last one. Next. What if I don't want to receive it? What if somebody like forks Bitcoin, and then uh, like I have a fork from the previous version or something? Like, do I have to accept it? Do I like if I'm I mean, never if going to? Me, if it's me, nobody's tax rate is a hundred percent. So you take it, you sell it, you pay your taxes. You're happy to pay it because you still got a spread on it. Yeah. Okay. All, all I know, guys, is that I need a raise because I clearly have a trillion dollar tax liability. They just have <laughs> yeah, so otherwise I'm just bankrupt and, and I'm going to be in jail. But actually, this is an interesting point, right? This is an interesting point because I think many people miss this. And it, this is this is quite important because because from a, I think from an, a tax perspective, this is how you can easily get wrecked. You get an airdrop that you accept at a market rate of whatever, let's say you got a hundred thousand dollar airdrop. Okay. Mm -hmm. You accept it. You technically have to pay taxes on that hundred thousand dollars. Let's say it then falls. Right. And that's the only coin. It goes down to a dollar. It's a rug pull on the airdrop. Mm -hmm. You now owe taxes on something that's completely liquid. Now you can write off the losses, but mm -hmm. it gets a little bit more complicated because one is income now and one and the other one is your it's a it's a uh, investment loss, right? Yeah. So can we talk about that for a second? Because everyone gets excited about airdrops and they're all nice when everything is going up, but they can be deadly when things go down. And this is no one talks about this. So alpha mm -hmm. leak for our audience. <laughs> and uh, this is why you guys have to uh, turn to Aaron and Aaron a tax bit. But can we talk about this a little bit? This is this is quite dangerous and it's a hidden part of crypto that people don't really understand. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's one of the assumed risks you're taking to a certain extent. And honestly, I, I personally don't know. I, I would think there'd have to be like some terms and conditions in all these exchanges, right? As to your ability to accept or reject a, an airdrop event but I, I don't know that enough but if you're not but if you're in a D, you're in a dex and you just have an offshore yeah. wallet or like a non-custodial exchange wallet, i have a metamask and i get ens drop let's say and then yeah. ens goes down but the, yeah. the point is that the airdrop you it's taxable as income to earn yeah. uh, to your point earlier but then the loss is an investment loss, short-term yep. capital loss, right? Which is taxed and treated very differently. And, you know, you can write off against uh, uh, short-term capital gains, but not against income. And so then you can actually be in a negative position based on the air job that you get and what you accept. Yeah. So I think, I think we, the reason that we had you both today is that, uh, you know, both Alex and I have been doing crypto for a while. And I think we both still have 2018 PTSD where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the January one marked the start of the bear market. And so I think that we're looking at this market saying, oh, we're up like 10 X this year everywhere for everyone. Uh, there's going to be probably some selling happening in December and who knows what's mm -hmm. going to happen in January, 2022. And so like what I'm doing out, I've got a, until the end of November. And then starting December, I'm really going to start taking a look at exactly how much I owe and exactly what not my investment are. advice. You know, I, no, not I mean, like, advice. I, it is, it is investment advice to figure out your taxes before the, before uh, December 31st comes to an end. Because yep. if something happens after December 31st, January 1 rolls mm -hmm. over and all of a sudden markets go to zero, there's yep. a tax liability. And unless you cash out or at least like move to st like stables or do something, you could be in a position where you have a huge tax bill and you're not able to pay it anymore. Yeah. A couple of things that I would that I would say there, Sam, is is one, amen to, to what you're saying. There was a question that was asked earlier in the chat, and I don't know what, that we formally addressed it, but the question was, do you have tax obligations on unrealized positions? And the answer to that is no. 
Now that is that is obviously outside of the income generating activity that we've talked about, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a distinction between those two things. But then what you're saying, Sam, is look, let's be strategic about taxes. And you know, too often um, we wait until you know late March, early April to log into our TurboTax and put stuff together. And it's just too late to action on anything for the prior year to impact your taxes at that point in time, particularly when it it comes to your your crypto. Um, So, yeah, I think it's a great idea to be strategic throughout the year. Use these types of tools. Go sign up for a tax bit account. Use these tools that allow you to see in real time your tax position to do tax loss harvesting where applicable and to optimize that tax position before uh, the following March or May, before the end of the year, when you can still action on it and be able to benefit from those actions. Yeah, I would just echo that real real time understanding of your gain and loss impact, especially if you're actively transacting uh, in crypto. If you're just buying and holding, you know, it's a little like me, it's a little less risky of the unknown. But if you're transacting, you're buying, you're selling, you're trading, you know, you utilize our tools so that you know your tax impact and you're not hit up with a massive tax bill at the end of the year. I will say, guys, our listeners, everyone's on here is definitely buying and staking and stacking on on our earned products so that's for sure mm-hmm. and yep. i mean at least the the people that i know everyone is in some sort of stacks earn or other earned products and so they are going to have these income returns mm-hmm. so everyone be smart how can people find you guys aaron and aaron how can they contact you so that you know people can enjoy uh, the fruits of their hard earned money and still and make sure that they're obviously being legal and abiding by the irs rules check out our website go to go to taxbit.com um set up a a a free trial account uh link up your stuff check it out Uh, we've got an awesome support team so i'll give a shout out to our support team if you have questions on loading up transactions things like that reach out to them they're amazing they really are and uh they'll help you out hit us up on social media we're really active on social media and um, we've got some really exciting stuff coming up, support for uh, uh, NFTs. We'll, we'll talk about a bunch more of this stuff coming out. So we're excited for what's to follow. And um, yeah, feel free to hit us up on, on the website or social media. Yeah. Yeah, I just put in um, the direct link to our task bit consumer. It'll take you directly to your free trial. You know, sign up, test it out. You can definitely reach us through the customer service and um, yeah, we're happy to happy to help. And I saw one last question, paying DeFi on taxes or yeah, gains on, on DeFi transactions. Yes. Like if you are, if you're transacting on DeFi, um, that's even more of an area where the personal, the onus is on you to, to track that and report it correctly. Well, amazing. Aaron and Aaron, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I still have a lot of questions. And so I'm probably, I, 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 you, I have probably need a CPA. I have a uh, token tax, or I have tax pit and I have uh, a, a bunch of other uh, things that I use for my taxes, but apparently it's not enough. The, the services are great for auto tracking, but at a certain point, you should get a, a CPA like uh, Alex and Aaron. Uh, because at yeah. some point you're going to you're going to run into the wall and you're going to start losing your hair over it and uh I need Aaron and Aaron I'm not I'm not qualified enough like they're they're, <laughs> they're dropping knowledge on me that I thought it was one way it's completely different so definitely I think reach out to tax but and uh yeah okay, we may uh, have to remove Aaron your uh, we we yeah. may have to remove your your uh degree back there yeah. <laughs> it's going to have to come yeah. down <laughs> It's true. I'm faking it till I make it. Basically, this is not real. It's all print. It's not a real NFT. If it was an NFT, you'd know. Well, maybe great to meet you guys. Thanks for having us on. So much for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you both. Bye. All right.